Hi, this lecture is a general introduction to robotics, originally given to final year undergraduate students a couple of months after Stanford won the 2005 DARPA challenge for autonomous guided vehicles. It's given here in two parts. There is also a subplot arguing that the imitation of life in all its various forms and functions is the key aspect of robotics which makes it special among academic disciplines. The complex interactions in living things make them difficult to handle using the reduction and analysis approaches which work well in subjects like physics where objects of study can be isolated and pulled apart in the laboratory. This doesn't work so well for life where taking say human beings apart to investigate their workings tends to have a detrimental effect on those workings. Robotics offers an alternative, practical, engineering synthesis approach to the understanding of life by imitating it. It's a bottom-up way of building complexity from simple parts and finding an understanding of the emergence of systems issues such as personality or intelligence from that construction. History shows us that it has to start simple and be eclectic, making full use of the insights delivered by reductionist analysis as well as newer approaches like artificial intelligence. Replay A2 here is an imitation of a Japanese newsreader, shown with her creator Hiroshi Ishiguru, the one on the right. She, or it, whatever, made news for working in an information booth at the World Expo 2005 fair, with most of her visitors thinking her human. A real-life sort of Turing test, although cheating, as she's pretty much a ventriloquist dummy. A fully autonomous android is still an ongoing task, but one in which huge advances are being made. As such an ambitious project, it's only fair that it incorporates just about all of science and engineering, along increasingly with a fair bit of psychology, sociology and even philosophy in, for example, the other minds issue relating to how we might cope with more advanced newsreaders in Replier, for instance. For now, the project lies in getting robots to perform sophisticated autonomous behaviours by using strategies derived from areas such as AI, mathematical modelling and optimization. These strategies are coded into software in appropriate system architectures and then implemented using the billions of devices per chip power of modern electronics. Billions of neurons, incidentally, being about a brain full. Part one here is a whistle-stop tour of robots in fiction, and then in fact, trying to bring out some important milestones in the development of robotics on the way. Part two will look at the current state of play in four key areas. Robot control architectures, autonomous navigation, bipedal walking, and finally returning to the imitation of life. Starting then with some more or less familiar robots and roboteers of the past. Legend, fiction and fact seem to get particularly mixed up in this subject. The notion of lifelike machines of various kinds seems to be ingrained into the human collective psyche. Many cultures have legends like the robot Talos, built to guard ancient Crete and brought down by the Argonauts. The Hindu Vedas have stories of fantastic flying machines and mechanical elephants. Jewish culture has golems, clay workers who had life breathed into them by the rabbi and helped defend the community. Mostly, these legendary robots seem benevolent and perhaps owed somewhat to people looking for help in tough times. Fiction tells a more varied story. Mary Shelley gave us an example of the robot as a monster, while Chapek gave us the very name robot as a slave worker in a play about factory exploitation in Soviet times. Asimov gave an optimistic view with his three laws of robotics, which have been quoted in every robot book ever since, and the idea of friendly and well-adjusted robot servants continued in books such as Ian Banks's Culture series. Unfortunately, these laws look a little unrealistic, considering the massive current investment in robot war machines, which often feature in films, like the clone say in Star Wars. Although Hollywood has also reflected a range of viewpoints, from sinister threats to humankind in The Matrix, all the way to the plastic pals of Hitchhiker's Guide. In reality, however, 
robotics stretches almost as far back as it does in legend. The next section picks out some of the major contributions to modern robotics. In Western culture, just about everything starts with the ancient Greeks. Architas here is known as the father of mechanics, a crucial discipline for robotics. He developed a rattle. He was an ancient Greek after all, to amuse children. He also apparently had the flapping bird. Hero of Alexandria was interested in hydraulics and mechanisms. Lifting an apple from the stand triggers Hercules to release the arrow, while a weight descends into a reservoir displacing water and air through the dragon, making it hiss, as well it might. This is an early automaton, a self-operating mechanism with a fixed behaviour. The ancestor of music boxes, player pianos and all manner of toys, curiosities and robots programmed to follow a fixed routine, like building cars, say. The great hero also developed this device. Taking wine from the bowl causes the level to fall, which in turn opens a valve to allow more wine to flow back into the bowl to make up the loss. It's an early form of closed loop bore feedback control, an important element of any complex system and the essential contributor to all sorts of novel and emergent behaviours. Nikola Tesla was a genius who invented just about everything electrical. He showed this radio-controlled vehicle, a surface-running torpedo, in 1893, predating Marconi. And it's the forerunner of all remotely operated vehicles, from robot wars through to military drones. Werner von Braun was a key player in the development of the World War II V-weapons and later in the NASA space program. The V-1 had a jet engine with a simple altimeter control for height. It took off from a ramp pointed in the right direction and fell to earth on London when the fuel ran out. It's an automatic guided vehicle, the forerunner of all devices executing a programmed sequence of events under feedback control, like delivering mail, say, or cruise missiles. Norbert Wiener invented the sciences of ergonomics and cybernetics, hence Cybermen, specifically linking machines and animal life. He worked on shooting down V1s, which was difficult because they flew fast and high, so that by the time a shell got to their altitude they'd moved on. He invented the stochastic Wiener filter to predict the future path of the missile from radar data and set up the gun so that the shell and missile met. The stochastic part meant that the predictor worked with uncertainty, fusing noisy radar measurements with deterministic models of vehicle and shell motion. Now, everyone interested in the subject must pass on one or two Wiener stories, true or not, so here's my chance. The Wieners moved house. His wife knew he'd be useless, so she packed him off to MIT with a piece of paper with the new address in his pocket. During the day, he had an idea scribbled furiously on the nearest piece of paper, decided it wouldn't work, and then threw it away. Arriving home in the evening, he found his home empty. At a loss, he noticed a small girl standing nearby in the street and asked, Excuse me, little girl, but do you know the Wiener family who used to live here? Do you know where they moved to? And the little girl replied, Yes, Daddy, Mummy said you'd forget. Stochastic Bayesian prediction and data fusion form an essential part of modern robotic navigation systems. Gray Walter was a physician. He constructed small autonomous vehicles with light and touch sensors and simple two-valve controllers. So they could, for example, be programmed to steer away from light unless perhaps their batteries were running flat, in which case they would move towards it. The interesting thing about this is that the behaviours of these very simple devices can become extremely complex and unpredictable, to the extent that human-like emotions can be ascribed to them, as eloquently described by Breitenberg. They hate bright lights, the red one loves the green one, but avoids the noisy one, and so on. This is an example of how very simple genetic type rules can give rise to very complex behaviours such that, like life itself, it's almost impossible to see any underlying simplicity that might exist. And these are one of the first autonomous vehicles that decide on their own operation, either in response to some programmed mission or to their inherent nature. 
Shanky, developed at Stanford, along with MIT, a major player in this field, was one of the first autonomous guided vehicles. It had a goal, to find or avoid large lumpy foamy things, which it wasn't very good at. It was computer controlled by Radiolink, as computers at that time were too big to fit on board. And it's notable for its logical sense plan act software architecture and its own programming language, Strips. Shaky used an internal model of the world to plan its actions. This included a lookup table to compare its current position with operators that could reduce its distance to its target. In the language strips is declarative, similar to modern Lisp and Prolog, differing from the more familiar procedural languages such as Fortran or C. For example, if the robot is in room R1 and wants to go to room R2, it checks out the operators. The operator go through door will get it to the goal, but the preconditions of being next to the door, the door being open and so on, must be valid. If they aren't, say if it isn't next to the door, it then recursively checks out all the other operators until it can find a complete chain of operations to achieve the required task. That sounds good, but why wasn't it so great? Well, it's largely the difference between building real robots and simulating ideal ones. The closed world assumption is that the robot model can contain all the information that the robot needs to operate. But it's in fact next to impossible to do this, even in a tightly controlled lab situation. And how would you model all the stuff in the real room with a finite amount of computer memory? If the model isn't exact, a wheel slips on an unfortunate beetle, or if something has been left out, then the robot will crash. The associated frame problem is how to include all necessary information in the model in a computationally tractable way. This is an architectural issue. Huge world models mean that the robot spends most of its time planning rather than acting. However, Shaky was one of the very first examples of a robot autonomously capable of organising its own behaviour to achieve a goal, an autonomous guided vehicle. And introducing some of the issues developed in part two, this is Uniru, a laterally bifurcated kangaroo, an early hopper from MIT good for the outback and put in here as a reminder that robots can be constructed to follow any form of motion that can be imagined, including none at all. This slide illustrates an alternative to building complex hierarchical brain type structures to achieve high levels of intelligent behaviour. Swarming insects like bees can do really sophisticated things as a group, solving complex optimization problems in moving higher, for example even though individual bees are rubbish at passing written examinations. Cynthia Briesel is shown here with her robot Kismet. Robots that need to communicate with real people, rather than programmers that is, need to do it on human terms rather than in computer languages. Kismet reacts with happy or sad faces to friendly or sudden movements. It is one of the first robots who try to interact with us in this way and is the forerunner of Replier. This thumbnail history concludes with a brief summary of some of the big challenges remaining. Computer hardware is still hard-pressed dealing with the real-time processing of video and sensor data, but progress continues to be made with the help from the Moore's Law advances in the computational power of electronics. Software architecture issues have proved a little more persistent, provoking some fundamental rethinks of the sense-plan-act paradigm. In order to overcome the frame problem and planning overheads that made the imitation of life hard for shaky. Another major task is to increase robot autonomy to cope with the world. It's like programming your car to take you home. Simply recording precisely your every action of the steering, brakes, etc. and replaying it exactly won't work because road usage will differ on the next trip. Precision isn't required. What's needed is less precision, but more flexibility and learning to adapt to uncertain and changing situations. The other big issue is to enable robots to interact with humans on human terms rather than via programming. They need not necessarily look like us, although it may help. 
that is, apart from the scary valley, where we are suddenly surprised to find Replier instead of Miss Fuji. And it also helps if they appear to think like us, even if they don't. So in part two of this introduction, after a quick glance at robot locomotion, let's look at some of the developments in architecture and design which relate particularly to the task of getting around. Then, strategies for walking with a comparison of analytical and AI approaches, and finally, a return to imitation, the issue we started with.